Can we put our hands together for the Lord one more time? I am so excited to be with you this morning. And I know that Pastor Jeremy, thank you so much for inter- uh, welcoming all of our guests. But as the lead pastor, if I have not met you, my name is Paul Heinzman, and it is a big deal that you have decided to come and make glad tidings a part of your Sunday morning. And so if there's anything that I could personally communicate to you, it would be this, welcome home. Well, God wants to do a work in your life. He is not absent. He is incredible. All you have to do is invite him in. And it is an truly an honor that God has allowed me to be a part of your journey this morning. So church family, would you help me welcome our guests? One, two, three. Welcome Amen. Welcome home. You know, I, I'm not really sure that the online audience is there because of our lightning strikes. I mean, you're like, well, this is kind of different, you know. Um, well, that is true. We, <laughs> we have been hit by lightning, and we are trying to make do, and we're trying to make all of the visuals and that sort of stuff work for us, but it is a little bit different over the last couple of weeks. How many you know that God is in control? And so every single one of you take a few minutes to pray this week and say, Let that insurance adjuster call Pastor Paul back. All right? Would you do that for me? (laughs) Oh, I love them. I love them. All right. You know, there are certain moments that uh, you want to clarify and you want to take a pastoral moment. Not that every week is not a pastoral moment because it is. But you want to emphasize, you want to talk about what's going on around us. And if you haven't noticed over the last 18, 19 months since I've been your pastor, I'm not a political guy and I don't get into politics. However, when something happens like this week when there is a overturn of Roe versus Wade, in a non-political way, I want to just take a moment to just encourage us on how the church should respond. All right, because there's individuals, and I don't know if you've actually taken some time to sit back and say, well, what does this mean? Well, it means the authority comes back to the state. I don't know that it changes anything in Illinois. However, we need to pray that it does. And if you're here for the first time, this is not a political statement. This is just me saying that we believe that God is the originator of life, and he's the one that ends life. Okay? That should not be something that any one person does. But I believe in this moment, if the church is really going to be the church, what is elevated is not a political decision or a decision that's been made. It is the extravagant love of Jesus and how we demonstrate it to the people around us. And so they know that there's hope because they feel like their life is in crisis. Am I making sense to you? And so... We need to be the church like never before. And we need to be there for young moms who don't know how to um, move forward in this decision making. Yes, we want to celebrate life and we want to celebrate them. So what does that mean? That means the church needs to get involved in foster care. A church needs to get involved in the adoption process. Adoption should not cost what it costs today. And so let's do that. Let's love people at the high... Love people the way that you have found Jesus' love for you. And if we do that, God's going to take care of the rest. Amen. I I do want you to know that being a part, it it is a blessing to be a part of a movement that's much bigger than Glad Tidings, much bigger than GT Church. And so we even have adoption and foster care programs. So if you have somebody in crisis, send them our way and we'll make sure that we provide that resource to them because we want to celebrate every life that God provides us. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's jump into our series this morning. This is the final week. Are you ready for the finale? Um, It's the final week of our series that I have called Courage Under Fire, that We as, and I'm not saying that this has not been important for every generation before mine, every generation before yours, the current generation, but we are in a pivotal time in our history that we need to decide to be the church. 
We need to make sure that God's word is the foundation of everything that comes out of our mouth, everything that we believe in, everything that we become a part of, that it would honor God, and as we honor God, he takes care of every other circumstance in our life. And so the first week was that we'd have courage for character, that in the moment that's most difficult, that it's easy to just do what everybody else is doing, that you would lean into power and to the power of God, and you would experience his character, his integrity, and his plan. Week number two, we talked about, and it's where we're going to end that story today. This is the moment that King Nebuchadnezzar built a statue, 90 foot tall, nine feet wide. And in the statue, it was basically what became a, what was a tourist attraction became a moment of pride for the king, and he wanted everybody to bow down to it. And so in that moment, you have three men that's a part of our story, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They decided that they would stand. So week two, they're saying, when everybody else is bowing, I'm going to decide to stand. In that week, I also talked about how culture how life itself, people around us, people without a relationship with God. And if you're here this morning and you think that people without a relationship with God have any context to the way that you think, we need to re-examine ourselves because they don't have any context to what it is. We've never lived in a generation before where people don't even know what a Bible is. And so if you think that just because of some type of moral code that they're going to understand what you think and what you believe, that is not the case. The Christ that lives in you needs to become so beautiful that they can't help but be attracted to him. And so when we stand, what we're saying is we're going to love extravagantly, love the people around us, and yet at the same time, we're gonna make sure that God's word is our foundation. What he says, I'm going to take God's word and I'm going to filter culture through it. And I'm never going to allow culture to filter God's word. Culture will never tell me what God's word says. God's word will tell me how I should live in my culture. Week number two, that we would stand. Week number three and last week is that there's moments in our life that God does not show up the way that we thought And our three men in this story, basically, King Nebuchadnezzar gives them another shot and says, hey, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you will bow down, I won't throw you into the fiery furnace. But these three men decided, I can't do that. I need to honor God in every decision that I make, and I choose to stand. So this week, we're going to talk about them being thrown into the fiery furnace. But in that moment, they make this powerful statement. The God that I serve will rescue me. Church. The God that we serve will rescue us. The God that we serve will show up. He's never left you. He's never forsaken you. You are not alone. And he was there for these four men. They said, but even if, even if he doesn't, I will not bow. Even if we don't get the answers that we desire, we're going to elevate our trust. God, I don't understand, but I trust. Lord, this doesn't make sense to me, but I trust you. Lord, I know that you have my best interest in mind, and you can see everything from now into eternity, so you know every single answer that needs to take place. Even though I don't understand, I'm going to lean into my trust because I know that you order my steps, and you have all my tomorrows in your hand. Come on, somebody. And so even if... We're not going to bow. I believe that the church like never before is in a season of testing. We have church splits going on. They're trying to change our language and they're trying to allow culture to tell us what the church should believe and what the church should think. And in the extravagant love of Jesus, we need to make our stand and say, only God's word. And as I love him, he's going to do the rest. Amen? So let's jump into this. Our four men, we, let's pick it up. You know that Israel is in exile. If you are here this morning and you missed the first three weeks, I'd encourage you to go to our YouTube page and to watch them. It'll be powerful for you in your life. But basically, these three men, and as well as Daniel, was four men that's been in the story, the book of Daniel. We're going to be in chapter three. So Daniel chapter three, if you want to go home and read the entire story. But the Israelites, they're in exile. King Nebuchadnezzar brought them to their 
the sin city of their day. And he brought them to Babylon. He said, listen, I'm going to teach you what we think. I'm going to have you say what we say. We're going to make, I I understand that you are the best of the best of the Israelites. And it would be of great wisdom for me to bring you underneath my umbrella. And so as I change you, you can help me change the Israelites. And he builds a statue and he he says, if you're not going to bow down, he's going to throw you into the fiery furnace. They'd play music, and if you didn't bow when the music started, you'd be thrown into this fiery furnace. Our young men realized that God was bigger than their fear. Maybe you're here this morning, you have different fears in your life. Rather than allow the enemy to elevate your anxiety, let's trust in the Lord and allow the Lord to elevate our peace. Our peace. And so these men are here. In Daniel chapter 3, I'm going to pick up in verse 19. Daniel chapter 3, verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude towards them changed. He ordered the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than usual. And commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, their trousers, their turbans, and clothes, were bound and thrown into the fiery furnace. The king's command was so urgent, and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took them up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the fiery furnace. These three men, they refused to serve a false god. The furnace has been heated up and the soldiers that were carrying them to the furnace died in the process of taking them into the mouth of the furnace. King Nebuchadnezzar, it's called King Neb, sees something that is life-changing in this moment. We're gonna go back to scripture before I say that I want you to understand something here. When people allow Jesus to be actively at work in their life, It'll be life-changing. It'll be life-changing not just for you, but for everybody that's watching. You see, we have this understanding, or we have this philosophy sometimes, is that we have to fix people. All the men in the house understand what I'm talking about. As a husband, my, my wife and I were having a conversation last night, and she had to begin the conversation this way. Hey, I want to talk to you about something, but Paul, I don't want you to fix it. What was she saying? Shut up and listen. Right? She got everything that you're going. I don't need you to quote his Bible scripture for me. I don't need you to tell me what I'm supposed to think in this moment. I just need you to shut your trap and listen. Now, she might not have said it that way, but that's what I heard loud and clear. (laughs) All right? It's... (laughs) God wants to show up in such a powerful way that it's not what you say that influences somebody. It is what they see inside of you, the Jesus that lives inside of you, the Holy Spirit that's poured out inside of you, and that is what will become life-changing for them. If you think you're going to fix their theological opinion on a certain subject, you are mistaken. However, when they see God's theology being lived out in your life, it will change their life forever. Somebody should be giving God praise right there. Daniel chapter 3, verses 24 and 7. Let's continue in our story. This historical event. I don't want you to think I'm reading some fairy tale. This is an actual event. God's word is true and accurate. So Daniel chapter three, verses 24 and 25. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that were tied up and thrown into the fire? They replied, certainly your majesty. And he said, well, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Looks like the son of the gods. I want you to know that the world is watching. 
And when you think that you're alone, he is right by your side. And they will see Jesus, not you, in your circumstance. Individual lives, as well as the church, we need to get this. We need to embody the fullness, the beautiful, be, the beautiful presence of Christ in our life, and that's what's going to make all the difference. When people begin to question our beliefs, when people begin to question your intentions, have anybody's intentions ever been questioned before? Just me, huh? All right? I mean, it's a true statement. Would you agree? We, our intentions are questions. When our confidence in Christ, you're saying, you're a quack. You're crazy. God's not going to rescue you. God's not going to heal you. God's not going to provide a way out. And they watch God at work in your life. It becomes life-changing. And I want you to know that God has never left you. Maybe you're here this morning, and you're like, man, I'm walking through it, Pastor Paul. If there's a season of my life that has been the toughest, I would say it is right now. I want you to know that you're not alone. He's never left you. And in fact, he's been with you the entire time. But I also want you to know as you submit to him, what people should actually see is the work of God at work in your life, not your human strength doing anything. God wants to show up in a powerful way. So today, if you haven't picked up on it, the title of today's message is You Are Not Alone. You're not alone. One of our values here at the church, our mission is the Great Commission. Our vision, we have different vision. We're launching ministries this year. Vision is a time stamp. It's like, okay, God, how, what do you want to do right now? But our values, one of our values is Connect. Why would we have connect as one of our values or connection? It is for this purpose. Without an encounter with God, we will never fully become who God has created us to be. You're not alone. He's with you. He wants to have an encounter with you. If you're here this morning, you're like, man, I've never felt that before. Or man, Pastor Paul, I don't, I don't really understand what you're saying. I would encourage you to spend some time and to pray and say, Lord, I might not understand everything that people say, but I understand that the pastor said that I can have an encounter with you. Would you meet with me right now? Would your presence fall on me right now? Lord, can I feel your presence right now? And he is faithful and he's going to show up. He wants to have a connection and a powerful connection with you. You might feel like the situation of your life has been heated up seven times hotter. Like you don't understand, Pastor Paul. You don't understand the pain that I am, I'm in. It's worse than anything I've experienced. And I would say I probably don't understand. You might be saying, hey, by relationships with my spouse or with a friend, a best friend, we were best friends for 20 years and all of a sudden they don't want to talk to me. Or you have a estranged relationship with a son or daughter, an aunt, an uncle, a mom or a dad, regardless of the circumstance, you feel like your situation has been heated up seven times hotter and you're right in the middle of a furnace, a blazing furnace. You're not alone. Wouldn't it be kind of cool if we were as passionate about revealing truth sometimes as we are passionate about re revealing our emotions? I mean, we've all been there before. Something happens and you go crazy, don't you? I, okay, maybe I shouldn't say that out loud. Yes, I go crazy. Lord, there's times I, <laughs> I, I have been going through the fiery furnace and my response was not what you wanted it to be. I go a little bit crazy. I don't think I'm alone in the house. What would it look like if we became so passionate we revealed truth? The enemy wants to say you're alone. You're like, oh, no, 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 no. My God is always with me. He'll never leave you nor forsake me. The enemy wants to say, you're raising those kids all by yourself. They walk out on you and you don't have any hope. They're going to grow up to be disobedient kids. I don't know what to say, all right? And so you're like, no, 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 no. I bring them up in the way of the Lord and God promises me when the time comes, they will not depart from it. God's promise is forever and ever, amen. I can believe in what his word says. Might be saying you're empty, you're all alone. I don't know that there's ever been a time in our culture that people feel more alone than right now. The effects of COVID has been astonishing. You might even be like my wife going through the Taco Bell 
uh, drive through this week, and they, and they ran out of Mexican pizzas. How ungodly is that? She felt all alone. <laughs> She's like, God, I, I'm your favorite. What's the deal, right? You are not alone. There's a God who wants to be a part of every detail in your life. In fact, Deuteronomy reminds me of this. He says, and, and as Joshua is beginning to take over leadership for Moses, they write down, and, G, and God says to him, be strong and courageous. Church family, be strong and courageous. He's going to see you through. Don't be afraid or terrified because of them. In all your way, and I'm sorry, because of them, for the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Come on, somebody. He's not going to leave you. He won't forsake you. You are his beautiful portrait for humanity. He wants to work in your life in such a powerful way that people notice him and not you. So who is them in your life. What does he tell him? He's telling Joshua, don't be afraid or terrified because of them. Well, who's the them in your life? Isn't it about time that you stop being terrified and you stop being anxious and we just trust God to move like he's never moved before? There's power in his name. There's power in his name. We serve a God that's with us. And Isaiah, Emmanuel, God with us. He won't leave you. He won't forsake you. He's always been with you. And then, then we jump to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And some of us want to stop right there. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lord, I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. But then we lean into our own understanding, don't we? Oh, God, this, this is what everybody told me is supposed to happen. This is how people have told me the outcome is going to be. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and don't lean into your own understanding. Acknowledge him or submit to him in all of your ways and he will make your paths straight. I don't know if I said the translation that's up there, but I, God wants to order your steps. He's always been present. He wants to work in your life. Acknowledge him. What is, what's he saying? What, what's, uh, what's Solomon, the smartest man to ever walk on planet Earth, what's he encouraging us to do? Acknowledge him. Turn your face to him. Turn your attention to him. And he will be with you. Trust, turn your face, God takes care of it. Turn, trust, rest. Turn, trust, rest. Turn, trust, rest. He's in control, church family. Counselors today, ta they talk about loneliness and people feeling alone. They call it this, the emotional epidemic of our decade. And it's only getting worse because we live in a culture that's starving for Jesus. People are feeling more alone than ever before. Maybe some of you have dealt with major seasons in your life that you've dealt with depression or feeling like you're alone. Social media has only enhanced it. And here's what's funny about social media. All right, I'm your pastor, and some of you might follow me on social media, on Facebook or something, and I don't post a whole lot, but you post and you see that I have the same boring life that you have, all right? Uh, what we do is we begin to follow people on social media like the rich and the famous, and they're out on yachts somewhere, and, and they're on the other side of the world. They're in Greece at the nice whatever that place is called in Greece, all right? Or they're in Mexico tonight and they're vacationing. It seems like every, every day of their life is like a vacation. God, why am I here? <laughs> You're sitting at home eating bonbons and eating that quart of ice cream and, you know, feeling sorry for yourself. Don't allow social media to make you feel like you're alone. You're not alone. I have found the more, when I feel alone, the more time I spend with God, the less I ever feel alone. I wrote it down this way. Loneliness is, the bene is for your benefit when it forces you to draw companionship from God that you would normally try to find in people. 
It's a mouthful. Everybody's cameras went up. They're like, I don't have time to write that down. I'm going to take a picture of that. Leave it up there for a second. We can draw close to him. Come on, somebody. You're not alone. When you find yourself at the most lonely spot of your life, take a moment, get his word out, spend some time just listening and praying and meditating on his word, and I promise you he'll show up in a way that is life-changing. It alters the way that you think. Draw close to him. He is always with you. As we look at this story between Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, how many know that they've been thrown into the fire? I've never been thrown into a furnace before. I've had some pretty tough situations, but I've not been in a fiery furnace yet. And here he is, he, and King Nebuchadnezzar, he throws them in, and then he begins to notice a fourth figure. The heat's been turned up, and they can't believe that they're still alive. But not only does King Nebuchadnezzar see that the three men are alive, all of a sudden there's a fourth man that's highlighted, and he's like, hey, didn't we only put three guys in the fiery furnace? Hey, didn't the soldiers die when they were taking them to the mouth of the fire? How in the world is there four I want you to know this morning that God is often most visible when times are most difficult. That's a word for some of us in the church. When times are difficult, it's almost when the real you comes out. Does that real you include this incredible power of the Holy Spirit, the work of Jesus in your life, or is it flesh? You know, I, I think if, if you're like me, I like to avoid challenges sometimes. How about you? I didn't get up this morning, and I didn't say, God, throw me into a fire. I didn't. So for some of you that might think I prayed that, and if you want to come up and be my fire, I didn't pray that this morning. All right? <laughs> There's nobody. You guys have been so loving. I, I, I pastor the greatest church on the planet. I want to be stretched and I want to become more like Jesus, but I can't say that I ever to ask God to throw me into a fire. I know he has work to do inside of me, and so when it happens, when I get tested, and when the Lord wants to do a work in my life, I need to trust him and lean into him and allow him to do the work. So there's three principles I'm gonna give you real briefly this morning. Three principles that will help you when you're thrown into the fire. Three truths when we're thrown into the fire. Number one, because God is with me. We say that with me, because God is with me. One more time, because God is with me. I will not stress about the setbacks. Well, I didn't mean for you to say that part, but that's cool. <laughs> Because God is with me, I will not experience, I will not allow the enemy to come in and bring an anxious spirit. I know that God is working on my behalf, and so I'm not going to stress the setback. Because if there's a setback, and the enemy is, is kind of working overtime, trying to get me to get off track, I know that there's an almighty God that's going to keep me on the track. And he's going to do a work in my life that changes me forever. I will not stress. And I don't know about some of you. I've stopped looking at my retirement portfolio. <laughs> it had 19% down, 20% down. And you're like, man, somebody, you need a better investor. I don't know, okay? But I, I look at stocks and this, I am set back. If I would look at the lie of the enemy, I would feel like I'm set back four years from retirement. That means I have to stay here until I'm 74, people, all right? You don't want that, no. <laughs> and so it's a setback, and I'm experiencing it. But I also know that my confidence is not in the rebound of a stock market. My confidence is in the one that controls everything. I can't stress about the setback. I need to turn my attention to my heavenly father and I know that he orders my steps, that every need is going to be taken care of in my life. And so even if I don't have any retirement whatsoever, he is gonna provide a way for me to exist and for me to live and all my needs to be taken care of. He's with me. 
Somebody needed to hear that this morning because you're watching the stock market and your portfolio just fall out of control. God is still in control. Instead of looking at that, look at the one who has tomorrow in his hands. Daniel chapter three, verse 25, he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth one looks like the son of the gods. Now, if you would read this in the Hebrew, he used a word called Elohim. Elohim is, you know that King Nebuchadnezzar is a polytheistic king, a polytheistic individual. In other words, he believes in a lot of gods. However, as scholars would look at it, this is the moment that he gets confronted with Elohim, the one and true God. He might be Elohim and believe in a lot of gods, but when the power of God is at work in your life so powerfully, it will turn people's attention to the Elohim in Hebrew, the one true God. That's what happens for King Nebuchadnezzar. This is one of the moments in the Old Testament that pre-incarnate Christ shows up. This is a moment that Isaiah chapter 43, I, I believe it's verse two, and it says that you will not be burned. You will not be set ablaze because the power of God is on your side. Verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It doesn't say this, but it's kind of like, and that other guy in there. The servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. God's not allowed you to go through your trial to kill you. God's not allowed you to go through your circumstance to take your life away or to make you feel like your life has been robbed from you. The same God that brought you to it will bring you through it. The same God that allowed it to happen to you will bring you through it. In this, in this moment, I, I was in my office and I was studying and I was praying and God gave me this illustration. I hope it makes sense to you because it makes sense to me. Um, for those of you, my, I love archery. Um, and so I, I spend time every fall going archery hunting. Not, okay, don't send me emails, all right? Um, and, and, and I love, I love practicing. I, I love going out and target and shooting targets and that sort of stuff. And God began, began to give me this picture of when, I, when I'm shooting my bow and, and I'm there and it's almost as like the tensions of life. Um, the bow in a, in a state can't do anything. A bow by itself can do nothing, but when you be, begin to put tension on that string and you pull it back, when you bring tension on it, that tension, that setback provides a forward momentum that allows God to help me hit the bullseye of my life. So what the enemy meant by putting tension in my life, what the enemy meant for evil by bringing poor circumstances, situations that I didn't think I had the strength to overcome, and he begins to put that tension on my bow. God takes that forward momentum and allows me to hit the bullseye of my life, and he'll do the same for you. He's with you. He's with you. He's fighting for you. Number two, because God is with me, say it with me, because... I can thrive through any trial. I can handle this. Yes, when other people fail and they flounder, I can thrive because I got an almighty God on my side. I can do this. I'm a believer. Christ is in me. Now, I think it would be kind of crazy for me to like it, but there's a part of me that Paul says, Man, I celebrate my trials because God is at work in my life. That was a paraphrase of Pastor Paul, all right? These guys defy the king. The king throws them into a situation, a circumstance that is seven times hotter than anything that they've experienced before. The struggle is real. How many of you know that your struggle has been real? What happened you know what might kill the normal person? The child of God escapes. What might destroy the normal person without a relationship with Jesus? God and his power allows us to stand strong 
and shows up when we need him the most. In fact, I would say this, he's never been absent. You're a child of God. Your, child, your trial will not kill you. Daniel chapter 3, verse 27. Let's move on in, in this historical uh, story. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire and the satraps, the, no, satraps and the perfects, the prefects, the governors and the royal advisors. Some of you are like, he needs to read this in advance. I did, okay? All right? The, the prefects, the governors, the royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies. Oh, no, not a hair on their head was singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell. Anybody say no smell? Man, I wish there was never a smell on me. No smell on them. There was Come on, somebody. There was no evidence they were ever in the fire. No evidence they were ever in the fire. Anybody like to barbecue? Okay, so if I barbecue with charcoal, I have this weird thing, you know, it, the smell of, I love the smell of charcoal, and it makes the best steaks, all right? I'm just saying, and this makes the best steaks. But, because, I don't know if it's my allergy or something like that. If I barbecue with charcoal, it makes my clothes stink. And if I don't go take a shower and change my clothes right after I cook the steaks, I get these headaches, all right? I can't barbecue and not stink, and the stink gives me a headache, all right? And so, now maybe you, when you're barbecuing, it's different, and you don't walk away from the grill smelling like the grill. <laughs> Or maybe you're saying that your life doesn't stink. <laughs> However, we can walk away from every circumstance that the enemy wants to throw our way and with no evidence that the enemy had ever had, that God will take every circumstance in your life and what the enemy meant for evil, he will use it for good. All things work together for those who love the Lord. All things, not some things, all things work together. You know, we like to test. <laughs> we, we don't like to test, do we? We don't like that. But you can't have a testimony without the test. The Lord is with you. And when we come out, you know, some one person, my mom loves roses. She might say, you smell like roses. Maybe we come out and we smell like Jesus. We smell like, instead of bitterness, we smell like Forgiveness. Instead of judgment, we begin to smell like grace. And the very fragrance of Christ is displayed in our life. Number three, because God is with me, my test will turn into my testimony. Because God is with me, my test will turn into my testimony. We know that in Revelation chapter 12, I believe it's verse 11, it says that we will overcome by the blood of the lamb and what? The word of our testimony. The work that God has already done, it is finished. And how he begins to show up, the fragrance of Christ in your life, the blood of the lamb, the word of my testimony, the power of God and what he is already and is currently accomplishing in my life. I will be an overcomer. Problem is we want the test, but we don't want to have a testimony. We don't want to go through that. We, we, want, we like to be on the stage, but we don't like the struggle. We want ministry, but we don't want the mess. We know that God has potential for us, but we want to live inside of our pain. God has a work that only he can do, but you have to submit to him. Let me encourage you. Jesus will see you through. He will see you through. Daniel chapter three, verse 30. Let's end our time together by reading this. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Praise be the God of GT Church. Praise be the God of Glad Tidings Church. Praise be the God of Pastor Paul. Praise be the God of every single individual that calls on him, makes him Lord of your life. Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has 
sent his angel to rescue his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and they were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language, in other words, he's saying, I've got power of the entire world. I I decree that the people of any nation, language, who say anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be burnt down into piles of rubble and no other god can save in this way, then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. I want you to know this morning, when you give your attention to Jesus, he'll take your pain and bring your promotion. He will turn your pain into promotion. You will be able to witness the power of God in your life, but not doesn't stop there. Your family members, your children, your, your co-workers, they will experience the power of God as well. Your pain will become your promotion. No one can save you like Jesus. Our church doesn't save you. Pastor Paul doesn't save you. There's not words that I can tell you to say that saves you. Your submission and your surrender to Jesus is the only thing that saves you. I was talking about this message weeks ago to somebody in the church, and we were having lunch together. Um... And he made a statement. In fact, I, as I was preparing this message, I was saying, I want to make sure that I, I, I quote this correctly because all too often, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego become the star of the story. Sometimes in our pride, we become the, pri- we become the star of our own story. It's not you that saves people. It's not you that brings them to repentance. It's Jesus who saves and his Holy Spirit that leads them to repentance. And and, and so this is what was said. The real star is the one in the fire, the one that was with him, unbound them, kept them from harm. Even every single on their heads from being singed, kept them from even smelling like the smoke. It is the same one who is with us, who frees us, who keeps us from harm, who won't even allow the stink of this world to be on us. Jesus is the star of the story. Who's the star of your story this morning? Come on, somebody. Who's the star of your story? Bow your heads with me. I want to be careful here because I'm not, I'm not trying to rile up some emotionalism. I just want to declare God's truth and it make an impact in your life. God wants to do something inside of you. You might feel like you're going through the fiery furnace, but he will bring you out. If he led you to it, he'll bring you through it and he can bring you out and not even allow the stench of this world to even be on you. But it begins when we surrender. It begins when we surrender. If you're here this morning and you have not fully surrendered your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you that opportunity right now. I don't want you to leave this place. This is very simple. This is, God, I give you my life. Lord, I I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. Lord, help me know what it means to live my life for you. And the Bible says that he'll listen to your words. He listens to the condition of your heart. And he is faithful and just to forgive you. Give you a brand new start. Have you made him the star of your story? If you have it on a count of three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And when you do that, you're saying, Pastor Paul, pray for me. I want to make him Lord of my life right now. One, two, three. Anybody in the house want to make that decision right now? Don't miss your opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody else? Sir, thank you. Anybody else? Don't miss it. The enemy, was, he'll come at you like a flood and make you feel like you can do this on your own. Thank you, ma'am. Without the power of God, you're never going to experience the fullness that God has always intended for you. One last time, is there anybody else? Church family, would you say this prayer with me? And again, let me just reiterate, it's not the words that you say, it's the conditions of your heart that saves you. 
surrender to the Lord. Would you say this with me? Say, Lord God, I give you my life. I make you my priority. Teach me what it means to make you Lord. I invite you into my fire. I invite you into my life and ask you to show up in a way that I can't deny your hand at work. Forgive me of all of my sin. By the power of Jesus, everyone said, amen. One more last word of encouragement for you. Let's, let's give it up for those who made a decision. Come on. Come on. If heaven's having a party, we can do better than that. Come on, church family. I think it's really important. You heard me share what I had to say in the beginning about Roe versus Wade, but I want you to understand something. When Jesus shows up, it's a sign to the believer and the unbeliever. When Jesus shows up in your life, your life becomes a sign to the believer. Let's have ecclesia. Let's, let's be in this, on this journey. We're in this fight together. Amen? But it's also to the unbeliever that they would see the extravagant love of Christ in all that you are and all that you do. Let's be Jesus. Amen? Amen. I've, next week we're going to... Um, I was going to start a new series. I'm going to wait a week to do that. I have a, a word that God's put in my heart, and I'm going to call it heaviness to happiness. Heaviness to happiness. Maybe you feel like you have a heaviness in your life, or you know somebody that's in your life that feels heavy. Bring them next week. Let it be a week that we, I mean, a week all by itself that we discover the contentment and the happiness that only Jesus can bring. Amen? And if you made that decision today, there is a card in front of you. Pastor Jeremy referred to it earlier. It's called Next Steps. It's yellow in the seat in front of you. Write down, I made a decision for Christ today. And then I would encourage you to take the next step. It says to be saved and then baptized. So put on there that you want to be baptized. And on July 31st, we're going to have our next baptism. We would love to invite you to be a part of that. God bless you this morning, I pray. I'm going to pray a blessing over you. I love this part of the service. I pray that the Lord will bless you. That the Lord, not the church, the Lord will keep you. That the face of God would shine upon you. Your life, everything about you, that he would shine upon you. And he'd be gracious to you. And that through his Holy Spirit, in a world of chaos, we would find his peace. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. It's been a joy to have you. Praise the Lord.